Hello, and welcome to an explanation of the bit shift and modulo combinator functions in Factorio and how to use them to build a digital numerical display and even a fully accurate game time clock for your factory. If you're interested in learning a cool application for combinators, keep on watching. But if you just want a neat clock for your factory, the string for a blueprint book for all the designs we make today will be in the description. Now the bit shift function can be a bit confusing to those unfamiliar with a base two or binary number system. When we take the number 44, for example, and then we bit shift it to the left by one. This is gonna be indicated by the double right arrow in our combinator. We can see that our output is gonna be 88. When we bit shift to the left by two, our output is 176. So you probably notice that the input is doubled for each time the bit shift left operator is applied. When we bit shift to the right once, change this to a one, we can see that our output is 22. If we bit shift to the right twice, our output is 11. Here, we're having our input for each bit shift. So more formally, a bit shift to the left by n is gonna multiply the input by two to the n, whereas a bit shift to the right by n will multiply the input by two to the negative n. In order to visualize this operation, I've constructed a simple 10-bit binary display. It's gonna use the bit shift write function in conjunction with the modulo function to convert a decimal number into binary and display it with lamps. A lit lamp represents a one, while an unlit lamp represents a zero. The display takes in a single number. For example, here, we'll use 44 again. And then displays it as binary. Now, let's use the bit shift operator here and see exactly what happens. Now, if I'm gonna use the bit shift left operator, you can see that the bits will quite literally be shifted to the left. If I shift it again here to two, you can see that they keep crawling this way. And if I shift to the right, you can see that they're shifted to the right. Now we're gonna use this to our advantage in order to cram a large amount of data into a very small amount of space and make a digital display with very few combinators. Now, firstly, we need to have uh, our data in a dictionary, which is a constant combinator that has a lot of values that we're going to be bit shifting around in order to display our digits. We have one value for each of the seven segments of our seven segment digital display. Now, if you don't care about how we attain these values, again, you can go down to the description and grab the blueprint book, which will include just this com constant combinator. But if you're interested in how we attain these values, let's go ahead and show you how we might find them. So first thing we want to do is make a nine by six matrix of lamps right here. We're going to use this in order to, oops, we're going to use this in order to design what our digits are going to look like and what our, where our segments are going to be on the display. So I'm going to grab a constant combinator here and attach it with an output of A equal to one. Very simple. Make sure all of our lamps are wired up. So this is all one big block. And what I'm gonna do is turn on some of these lamps. I'm gonna set enabled condition of A is greater than zero. You can see that the lamp turns on. I'm gonna shift right click it and make one of our segments and just show you where all of our segments are going to be. And I can see here that we've created an eight, but we want all of these segments to be able to move and activate and act, uh, deactivate independently of each other. So in order to do that, we need to add a few more signals. Oops, apparently our <laughs> lamps had some contamination on them. Gee. So what I'm gonna do is just turn them all off and we'll start anew. This is gonna be A is greater than zero. And we'll light all of these up. Our left column here will be intentionally left blank to give us some space between our numbers. For example, here, if we display a 44, you can see we have a space between them so they're not hugging up against each other. Anyways, this will be our A segment. A is greater than zero. For these, we want B is greater than zero. C for these, again, shift right click to copy, shift left click to paste. D is greater than zero. E is greater than zero. F is greater than zero. G is greater than zero. 
So now we have seven independent segments. And if we play around with our combinator settings here, we can turn on and off segments as we please. We turn them all back on so that we can start manipulating our values. Now, we're going to use these signals along with a few simple but powerful combinator tools to populate a list that gives us our dictionary values. So let's start with a pulse generator. We're going to need this in order to get a one tick pulse of a value that we can then store in a memory cell. Memory cell we can start over here. It's everything we need for them. And finally, we're going to have our bit shifter over here, which will take our values and bit shift them appropriately. Now, since the memory cell is the simplest, we'll start with that. We want our parameters for our decider combinator to be R, our reset symbol, is less than 1. So we'll have a reset signal R that we can attach from this constant combinator to reset our decider combinator if need be. And we're going to output everything with its input count and then loop its output back to its input with a green wire. Now. The reason that we need a pulse generator for this, if I attach this, this constant combinator here and just try to input a value like E equal to one, you can see that our value very rapidly starts climbing. Uh, this is actually a clock and we're gonna be using one of these later on, but right now it's not what we want. We wanna have some very precise values. So let me flash the reset signal and then turn this off so that our memory cell can function. See so yeah, the memory has been cleared. Now we have our pulse generator. Now the pulse generator is allow, going to allow us to make a one tick pulse that the decider combinator here in our memory cell will be able to hold in memory. We can use it later. The way we're going to do this is connecting both of our inputs right here together with a red wire and then connecting the output of an arithmetic combinator to the decider combinator. The arithmetic combinator's input needs to be each value times negative one with an output of each value. And our decider combinator needs to be each value that is greater than zero, output each value with an input count. Now, when we connect the output of this decider combinator to the memory cell decider combinator, what's going to happen is a positive value will be added on this red wire. Since combinator's actions always take exactly one tick, on the first tick, which is the smallest unit of time in Factorio, on the first tick, this combinator will say, okay, you're greater than zero, so I'm going to allow you to pass through. Whereas this guy is going to say, okay, I'm going to multiply this by negative one and then output on the green wire. On the very next tick, the negative value on the green wire will cancel out the positive value on the red wire, and this decider combinator will stop outputting because it no longer has any inputs. This value will then be stored by our memory cell. Finally, we need our bit shifter. So this guy is going to be turned off for the time being. What we're going to do is copy all of the values that we want from our combinator here that make the digit that we want and bit shift them by whichever digit we're trying to display. And since, uh, just a little, a little cheat here, I can see that we're bit shifting to the right. We need to do the opposites here. So we need to do the bit shift to the left function. Uh, and we're going to do this by 0 for our 0, 1 when we're building our 1, 2 when we're building our 2, etc. So we'll start it with 0, start bit shifting by 0, and then move on from there. We're going to output each value, and each value will be passed through to our pulse generator. So all told, when we turn this combinator on with some values, those values will be bit shifted. Initially, they'll be bit shifted by 0, which won't change their values at all. Then those bit shifted values will be passed to our pulse generator, which will pass them into the memory cell for just one tick, which will then store them for later use. Now, let's take a look at our display here. If we want to make a zero, we can see that we want the outside segments to be turned on, but this inside segment, segment D, to be turned off. So we can just right click that segment in order to turn it off. Now, just to make the reset easier, uh, I'm going to put a copy of this constant combinator right here. Let's go ahead and turn off our D. You can see now that we have a pretty good looking zero. So when we're confident, 
with how we have our zero set up. Let's shift right click on this constant combinator and then shift left click on this constant combinator to copy the settings. So let's go ahead and turn it on, bit shift it by zero, pass it through and store it in memory. You can see all of our combinators flash for just one tick. And we have these values enabled. Let's go ahead and turn this combinator off once they're done. And the order that we do our actions here is rather, rather important in order to not corrupt our data. We wanna turn our constant combinator off. We wanna increment this to our next digit. So we're gonna be making a one next. And then we wanna move over to here and start making our one. So one has only segments C and F enabled. So here's our C. Let's copy it over here. Just check to make sure that you're bit shifting by the correct digit and then paste. It'll turn on, it'll flash, and now we have these values. We have a three for C and F and one for each of A, B, E, and G. Go ahead and turn this combinator off, increment up to our next digit two. Let's copy this over. Now to make it two, I wanna turn off segment B here and segment F here. So let's right click our B and our F, and we have a nice looking two. Let's copy this, make sure we're shifting by two, and then paste it. Now we have a C of seven, an A of five, an E of five, a G of five, a D of four, an F of three, and a B of one. I'll do one more of these digits, uh, and then I'll let you do the others on, the own, on your own to keep the length of this video somewhat reasonable. So let's make our three now. A three is going to have segment B and segment E turned off. So let's turn off B and E. That looks like a pretty good three. Make sure that we're bit shifting by three. Paste them in there. So your values should now look like this. So you can continue on your way uh, from four through nine like this. And once you're done, your decider combinator should look a little bit like this one with values of over a thousand for F and A, and then C, D, B, G, and E are all readable exact values. Now we need those exact values uh, to be added to a constant combinator. So what we can do, we see that C is 927. Let's make a C with a value of 927. D is 892. E is 325. F, well, F is over a thousand, so that's not great. Uh, we have E is 325, uh, G is 365. And I <laughs> see that I'm doing these in a pretty wacky order, but that's not too bad. And then B is 881. You know, we've come to a bit of an impasse. We don't know what our values for F and our A are. So we need to do a little bit of a trick here and just take each value in an arithmetic combinator and subtract 1000. This will give us a readable exact value. So you can see they're outputting F is 19 and A is five. That means that the actual value for F is 1019. The actual value for A is 1005. So let's add these values. 1019 for F. Okay, good. This combinator is going to be our dictionary. So go ahead and add it to your blueprint library. I'm not going to add it as I already do, but hopefully uh, you can have this and cherish it forever. Now, right now, our display works very manually. We need to flip all of these uh, letters ourselves. So let's make a dynamic display. Let's cut this combinator that we no longer need. Move our dictionary to right here next to the first panel. And we're actually gonna copy this and make a second panel. All right, make sure that these panels are separate. You can mouse over them and see that one highlights then the other highlights. Now, when we're inputting a number into our display, we need to do two things for multi-digit numbers. If it's a single digit number, it's not too bad, but we're gonna assume that we're gonna be displaying some larger numbers. Now, we need to take the last digit of our multi-digit number, that's the number that we're gonna be displaying before moving it leftward onto the next panel. And we need to take all the other digits and pass them along. So the current digit gets displayed, the rest of the digits get passed along. So to do that, we're going to use two separate arithmetic combinators, one of which is going to use the division operation. So each input that comes in is going to get divided by 10. 
Now the division operation in Factorio automatically truncates for you, so you don't need to worry about decimals or remainders or anything. If, for example, we take the input 25 and divide by 10, the output would be 2.5 that gets truncated to 2. So it's just going to shove along a 2. If you put in 326, divide it by 10, you'll get 32.6. It gets truncated to 32. So this is a very simple way of getting those digits. And I'm going to output them as a signal X. Is uh, important because, well, it doesn't, it's not important that it's an X, but it's important that it's a named signal because we're going to be using it a little bit later. Now, we're going to take each and now use a modulo function. Now, if you remember from earlier, uh, explained a bit about modulo, how uh, it takes whatever your input is, divides it, and then spits out a remainder. So we have uh, h modulo. 10. So each value is now going to be divided by 10, but instead of outputting the quotient, we're going to be outputting the remainder. And here we're going to be outputting a green signal. All right, so here's the tricky part. Now we're going to be doing a bit shift operator. Now when we stored our values in memory, we bit shifted them all to the left. Now in order to retrieve them, we want to bit shift to the right. So I want to take each value that we're being input into this uh, combinator and bit shift to the right by whatever the value of the green signal is. So this uh, is going to bit shift right by the amount of digits, which counteracts what this combinator did when we built our dictionary. So it'll get us back to the ones place that we care about here. And here, what we're going to do is output each of our values. Now, the way that we set these up together is a little bit important. So these two the division and the modulo combinators need to be attached together with a green wire because their inputs are always going to be shared. The dictionary with all of your values is going to be attached with a green wire to the input of the bit shift operator here. And now with a red wire, specifically a different value so as not to contaminate your signals, is going to move from this modulo combinator into the input of this bit shifter. So now, whenever we attach a number to this green wire. It'll take a modulo 10, which will give us the digit that we were trying to display. Then it will take all of our dictionary values and bit shift them by that digit. And then the final thing that we need to do is another modulo function, which takes each of our inputs, which will be our A through G's, and then we're going to modulo 2. Now this way, only the ones that have a ones place that are enabled will be enabled. So let's connect the output of this uh, bit shift into the modulo and then attach the modulo to the panel. And if you did everything correctly, it should immediately light up with a zero. I did not do everything correctly. <laughs> um, what am I missing here? I am missing. Oh, an output. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> so. Uh, make sure that all of your uh, things are set, eh? Okay, so this immediately outputs a zero once we output each. Isn't that embarrassing? I make this build up about how if you've done everything correctly, it just works, then I don't do everything correctly. I should make a tutorial. Anyway, uh, now we have a one digit display. Very exciting stuff here. Let's put a constant combinator down here and start trying some different values. So let's try a value of one. You can see immediately it's updated with that value of one. We can even scroll up through our numbers and see that two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, whoops, eight and nine all work. But once we go past that, we're hmm, not so much. So we need to extend our display so that it can satisfy more uh, digits. Let's make some room for that. I'm gonna cut and paste everything such that it's right about here. That'll give us a lot more room to work if we want to expand our digits later. Now, there is a bit of an aesthetic thing that I like to do with these, and that's to add a decider combinator here. Now this decider combinator is going to prevent the display from filling up with zeros when we're trying to display a small number. So for example, if we had a five digit seven segment display that was trying to display the number 30, 
it would display it as 0, 0, 0, 30 instead of just the 30. Those zeros are extraneous. I don't like them, so I use this combinator to get rid of them. This combinator's parameters are going to say uh, if x, there's that x signal from before that we got from our division combinator, as long as x is greater than 0, then you can output everything. So as long as we have a positive x signal, which is only going to happen when our arithmetic combinator here, uh, or our, yeah, our arithmetic combinator here outputs something, which in turn is only going to happen if we have a two or more digit number, only then will it allow uh, data to pass through. And instead of going directly from the modulo to the display here, I'm going to use this as my input for the second panel. Everything else, is going to be exactly the same. So we can take these four combinators and just copy and paste them. And now we just need to make some connections. So the this, the division combinator here will connect with the green wire to the inputs of both our new decider combinator and the pair of arithmetic combinators that we have here. The bit shift combinators need to share a green wire on their inputs so that both of them can get the, the values from our dictionary. And we're going to use a red wire to connect the second modulo here. Instead of to the display like we did previously, we're going to connect this to this decider combinator. So now we should be able to display two digits. So let's go ahead and try to display n equals 15. You can see we have a 15, 73, 25. We can display any two digit number we want. Now, as our display get, grows longer and longer, extending it grows easier and easier, which is quite nice. Now, we can just copy this 9x6 panel along with the combinators under it. Just go ahead and plop them down right here. Now, we need to do a little bit of uh, connection again. So our bit shift inputs need to continue extending with this green wire. And our division, again, needs to output with a green wire onto here. Since these are already connected, this is all we need to do. Now we can display a three-digit number. So how about one, two, three? Or four, five, six? Or seven, eight, nine? But if we try to display something, for example, zero, 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 because there's extraneous zeros, these combinators filter them out and it will display simply zero. Now that we have three digits, extending it is even easier. We don't even have to worry about connections anymore. All you want to do is copy the last two panels now and paste them such that they overlap fully in blue here. And now we have a four segment, or a four digit display and can display four digits at a time. You can copy this now as many times as you want to build a display as big as you want, but keep in mind that Factorio's signals are 32-bit unsigned integers and thus max out at 2,147,000,000 and some change. So uh, I know Factorio can be a little nuts, but <laughs> it should be good enough for most general purposes. So now let's do a cool application of this and build a nice game time clock. Here. What I'm going to do is I'm going to take the four segment display that I have over here, just these four. I'm going to copy and paste them down here and we'll put them lined up so that we can kind of see this thing come together. Now, a couple things are going to be different about how this clock looks and functions. You can see here we're about to uh, come over 59 to 60. Now, a normal digit display here can display 60 and 70 and 80 or whatever but so we're going to need to change our math a little bit so that they roll over uh, on 5 to 6 instead of from 9 to 10. Uh, also just for aesthetics I like to have these colons here to make it look a little bit more like a clock. So we'll do that first because it's pretty easy. Let's grab these two uh, panels here and delete them. What I'm going to do is just move them over so that there's two spaces of gap and then move them over so there's two spaces of gap. And this will give us our seconds, our hours, and our minutes. Let's copy this column here. It's not, uh, it's our blank column. And we'll fill in our gaps so that it gives us a nice solid look. Okay, so now we have the size that we need. Now we need to change the math. 
So for our seconds and for our minutes, since seconds and minutes roll over at 59 instead of at 99, we want to change the division and the modulo here. Instead of divided by 10, we want it to be divided by 6. Instead of modulo 10, we want it to be modulo 6. We want to do the same thing over here for the, uh, the tens of minutes. Divided by 6, modulo 6. Now our values should be correct when we're dealing with time. To check this, what I like to do is add a constant combinator as an input and try the number 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. And if we've done this correctly, the output should be... Oops, <laughs> we haven't done this correctly yet again. We need to connect our combinators again. So uh, just like we connected them when we were building up to our three-digit display, you need to connect the bit shift combinator to the bit shift combinator, bit shift combinator to bit shift combinator, and then we need to connect division combinator to the inputs, division combinator to the inputs. I really should stop saying if you've done it correctly because I'm currently 0 for 2 on that. All right, so we should get the number 3, 25, 45, which is uh, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 seconds expressed in hours, minutes, and seconds. Finally, for our colons, for aesthetics, we can grab the lamps that we want to be always turned on and set them to something that's always true. For example, A equals zero. Since these guys are never going to get inputs, A equals zero will always be true for these. And we can do it like that. So now we can see that we have what looks like a clock, but well, this one's moving and this one's not. So how do we get this one to move? Now, if you remember earlier, I talked about how a memory cell that's not bounded by a pulse generator turns into a clock. So we're going to use that to our advantage. So I'm going to set up a, an arithmetic combinator, a decider combinator, and a constant combinator. I'm lots refilling my <laughs> vast uses of wires here. So this is going to give us our clock, and this is going to divide it by 60 to get us from game ticks into real seconds. So our constant combinator here will have an output of t uh, with a value of 1. Let's connect that to the input of our decider combinator. We're going to use the same settings that we did for our memory cell. As long as the reset is less than 1, we're going to output everything with an input count. And then we're going to loop it back onto itself. And you can see that our t is going to start counting up. In this case, this is the behavior that we do want, so this is good. Now let's connect the output of this combinator to the input of this arithmetic combinator. Take each input and divide it by 60. Outputting each input. And outputting each. If we mouse over this arithmetic combinator now, we can see that the output signal is incrementing by 1 every second. If we snip this constant combinator and get ourselves back to 0, we can hook up the output onto the inputs of our display, and now we have a clock that's ticking up every second. We're almost there, uh, but as you can probably tell by my mini-map, and if I zoom out a little bit, I've been playing this map a little bit longer than 45 seconds. So I'm going to need to add some values uh, to make sure that our clock is a little bit closer to the real time that I've spent on this save. Before I do that, however, I'm going to let this roll over so that you can see that instead of going to 60 seconds, it goes to 1 minute. Excellent. Now, we're going to... Uh, add on an R signal here because we need to get an exact value for our game time to be as accurate as possible. Now, this R signal resets and clears our memory and makes it so that it's not going to work anymore. What we're going to do when you're ready is right click this R signal to delete it and then very quickly hit the escape key twice. This will bring up the game menu where we can save and when we do save we can load game, and up here we see an exact count of our playtime. What you're going to do is open up your favorite calculator, either a TI-83 you have at your desk or the calculator a program on your computer, uh, and we're going to calculate uh, the, your game time in ticks. Now, this is going to be different for everybody unless you also have saved at exactly 55 hours, 39 minutes, and 6 seconds. So I'll tell you the method that we're going to use to do this. And... All of these operations are separate. We want to hit equals after all of these because we could get screwed by order of operations if we don't. So you want to take your number of hours, in my case 55, multiply it by 60. So hit equals. Now I'm up to 3300. 
Then you want to add your number of minutes and then multiply. Once you've hit equals, multiply by 60 again and hit equals and then add your number of seconds. So this is your total game time in seconds. Mine right now is 200,346. And then finally, you want to multiply by 60 to get your game time in ticks. Now, mine is 12,020,760. Yours will be most likely different. Uh, hop back into your game. Now, it doesn't matter uh, how long you take doing this because the clock will be adding the values that we're getting after that save. Uh, so now what we want to do is build one more pulse generator. So we need a decider combinator, an arithmetic combinator, and a constant combinator. The arithmetic combinator should take each input, multiply it by negative one, and output each. The decider combinator should take each input that is greater than zero, and output each with input count. We'll turn off our constant combinator for now, just so that we don't accidentally input any data that we don't want. The output of our constant or our arithmetic combinator should go into our decider combinator, and then the output of our decider combinator should go into our clock. And we're going to use this to seed our clock with a time. So you can see that it's been running for almost a minute now, but that's not going to matter. Let's add a t with a value of exactly the number that you got when you ran the calculations. Mine's going to be twelve million zero two zero seven six zero. When I turn this combinator on, it will seed my game clock. And you can see that while they're slightly out of sync, it should give me a value that is almost exactly the same as the clock I'd already had running. Once you've seeded your clock, you don't need this anymore. And you're all set. You've got a fully functional in-game clock. You can even slash time. You can see that uh, two days, seven hours, 40 minutes, and 38 seconds is exactly the same as the game time that was being displayed. All right. Now, if you're like me, and you're an enthusiast who likes to play maps for over 100 hours, <laughs> we could go ahead and copy the two panes from the hours, the two panels for hours. Uh, and again, we can do this overlap here. Um, you can even add a fourth digit if you'd like. Although, as I mentioned before, with the 32-bit uh, unsigned integers, the maximum amount of hours this clock can record is just under 10,000. So if you're planning on playing a save for more than 10,000 hours, I commend your persistence and you're going to have to find your own clock blueprints. I hope you found this video interesting, informative, and maybe you learned a thing or two. If not, I hope you at least have a cool clock for your factory from my blueprint book. Thank you for watching.